are you okay? Getting this wet. I found the woman I always meet just in time for the last train, crying on a bench at the taxi stand, drenched in the rain. I instinctively called out to her, deciding to share a taxi and drop her off at her home. Maybe it's because we see each other every day. Despite it being the first time we spoke, I felt a natural sense of closeness, as if we had been talking all along. My name is Ricky Henderson. I'm 37 and work in sales. My workplace manufactures women's clothing and bags, and my job is to promote these products to our clients. But because we deal with women's products, there are a lot of women both at work and among the client representatives. Over half of my colleagues are women, with many being married and mothers. My mentor and direct supervisor retired last year, and a female supervisor transferred in from a different department. The new supervisor favors female employees who are married or raising children. She's flexible when children are sick and employees need to call off work, and she's good about reflecting paid time off requests. However, she is quite strict with single people. Ricky, you're alone when you go home, aren't you? Since you have nothing else to do, I'm leaving this task to you. Today, like always, I was burdened with extra work by the supervisor and was swamped with overtime. Recently, it's been especially bad, with me working overtime almost every day for a month. It was so unreasonable that I even argued against her. Even I want time and space to do house chores like laundry and cleaning. But the supervisor glared at me, laundry, cleaning, you can do that on your days off. Other people also have to take care of their children and prepare meals on top of that. I was taken aback by her harsh tone and couldn't say anything back. Isn't this discrimination against unmarried people? I won't lose to that unreasonable supervisor. I kept murmuring to myself as I worked overtime day after day. I'm a stubborn person. But that doesn't mean I can work endlessly. I've been barely catching the last train for several days now, feeling immensely tired and sleep deprived. Today, as I rushed to the station just in time for the last train again, I saw the familiar woman. Oh, it's her reading a thick book again. I wonder what she's reading. I end up staring at the woman because I'm curious about something that doesn't really matter. It seems she sensed my gaze because she looked back at me and our eyes met. In a panic, I averted my eyes and looked down at my cell phone. Lately, we've been seeing each other almost every day at this late hour, right before the last train. I'm sure she must have recognized me by now. I wonder if she finds it suspicious that I keep staring at her. Despite my worries, I find myself looking her way. Like me, she always arrives at the station just in time for the last train, engrossed in something book. Not only that, but there were also moments when I caught her quietly shedding tears while looking at her phone. I wonder if she's also being dumped with work by her boss or someone. I can't help but speculate about her. Tommy, she's a figure of interest, and I find myself watching her whenever we meet. One day, I was fighting against overtime as usual, right up to the last train. But it was raining heavily that day, like an overturned bucket. You've got to be kidding, I didn't bring an umbrella. Muttering to myself, I ran through the rain to the station. No sooner had I reached the ticket gates than the last train pulled away. Crap, not my day, I grumbled, heading to the taxi stand. There, on a bench, I saw a familiar woman crying in the rain. Of her, why is she crying? Drawn to her, I approached and asked, You're soaked thruff, are you okay? Oh, I'm fine, don't worry about it, she said, hiding her face. You don't seem okay. You might catch a cold. Are you heading home now? Where's your place? I found myself speaking naturally in her presence. Maybe because I see her every day. Despite it being our first conversation, 
I felt a natural closeness to her as if we've always talked. I live in Hintington, she replied through her tears. I live there too. I'll share a cab with you part of the way. I decided to somewhat assertively join her. When she got in the taxi, she told the driver her destination and spent the whole journey crying alone. While I was concerned, I didn't dare to ask her anything. Here, you can use this to wipe your eyes. I offered her my handkerchief and saw her off as she headed home. I went to work as usual the next morning, again clocking out just in time for the last train. However, for some reason, she was nowhere to be seen. Could she have caught a cold? I found myself thinking and kept an eye out for her at the station. One day, my supervisor suddenly asked, could you handle the ab market negotiations? An urgent matter came up and I can't go. But it's your responsibility, isn't it? How far have the negotiations progressed? I'm not sure about it since I'm not in charge. I responded, just read the materials, you'll be fine my supervisor said before leaving the office. Ed Market is an online retail company based overseas that sells clothing and bags. With a computer or cell phone, anyone can purchase their products from any part of the world. It's a great honor to have our products in their service. Therefore, mistakes and rudeness aren't acceptable. I went to the client as a replacement for my supervisor but ended up listening to complaints about her. That lady is always late with her responses, and her handling is careless. Our president is the same. Both of them are slow and really sluggish when it comes to work. The client's representative complained not only about my supervisor, but also about his own president. The representative had been much more polite and kind when I had previously visited with my supervisor. But on this day, he was evidently irritated and the negotiation ended without a deal. I gave up and decided to return to the office. As I walked out of the meeting room and into the hallway, I passed by the woman I'd shared a cab with recently. When I looked surprised, she also looked surprised and bowed, saying, Oh, it's you. Thank you for the other day. Then, in a rush, she took out her business card and handed it to me, saying, I apologize for not introducing myself sooner. I'm Emily, the president of Ad Market. What? You're the president? Taken aback, I handed her my business card in return. I'm Ricky from BC Apparel. My father, who was the former president, fell two months ago, and things have been chaotic. I couldn't introduce myself sooner. I'm sorry. Emily, as she was now known, apologized again and then whispered softly. I'd like to thank you for the other day, so if you have a free day, could you call me at the number on my business card? No, no, there's no need for thanks. I didn't do anything special, I replied modestly, but Emily looked a little sad. But I still haven't returned your handkerchief. Could you find some time for me? Despite being the president, Emily seemed so timid and humble. Without thinking, I replied with a resounding, sure, I'll contact you again. Fast forward to a few days later on a Friday night. I had arranged to meet with the president of a client company at a renowned fine dining restaurant. The place was known for its high-end service and food. I had never been to such an expensive restaurant before. What's more, I had no idea that the woman I had been seeing at the station was the president of my client. I headed to the restaurant with a mix of surprise and shock. I was so nervous and didn't know what to talk about. Then, Emily, as she asked me to call her, broke the ice by saying, I know we just got here, but would you mind listening to my problem? Go ahead. Please tell me anything. I replied in a surprisingly energetic manner due to my nervousness. I was an ordinary employee of my father's company before my father, the former president, collapsed two months ago from a cerebral hemorrhage. Then I was put in charge of the president's business. I listened to Emily's story and suddenly remembered her reading a thick book at the station just before the last train. That's why you studied every day. 
I was satisfied in my mind and asked, Um, how is your father? I asked Emily. His life is not in danger, but he's bedridden and can't move or speak, she said. I felt a cold sweat trickling down my back. I felt I had asked something I shouldn't have. She continued, My mother passed away a few years ago, and I have no one to rely on. The employees say I'm not dependable, and my relatives tell me I'm not cut out to be a president. I've been feeling down. Emily shared her troubles while wiping away her tears. Because they think I'm not reliable, my relatives are trying to set me up with a guy who runs a company in the same industry. They're suggesting I should marry him and merge the companies. Mergers, marriages. Do your relatives decide all those important things? I found it hard to believe what Emily was sharing. But Emily, wiping away her tears, said, My father can't speak, and I'm too timid to oppose my relatives. The man they've set me up with is very arrogant, and his harsh messages make me cry every day. I don't want to ruin my father's company, but I'm constantly worrying about what I should do. Her words reminded me of the time when I saw her crying at the station while looking at her cell phone. You shouldn't have to deal with work or marriage alone. You should firmly refuse anything you don't like. I gave her the best advice I could. Emily wiped her tears and gave a small smile and said, Thank you. Just talking to you has made me feel a little lighter. Since that dinner, whenever we both had time off, Emily and I started to go out for meals together. I was worried about her and just couldn't leave her alone. I felt I wanted her to share everything with me, even her worries. When I talk to you, Ricky, I feel at ease, but I'm sorry. I keep complaining about my work every time we meet. Aren't you tired of it? Every time we went out to eat, Emily would check on my well-being before we parted. No worries, I feel trusted. And by the way, you don't have to speak formally. You can just talk casually with me. If I'm going to talk casually, Ricky, you should too. I'd be happy if we could become closer. Her innocent smile made my face turn red up to my ears. I found it comforting to watch Emily as she spoke energetically or seriously, and I just nod along. She seemed relieved when I told her about my work complaints and private marriage concerns. Emily was both a business associate and a friend. Our unusual relationship continued for a while, and we shared various stories with each other. Emily was gradually becoming more capable of handling her presidential duties. Watching her growth was a great joy for me. Today, I made my way to Emily's company again, pushing forward discussions with the person in charge. The president, who I thought had finally gotten the knack of working efficiently, is often seen smiling at her cell phone during work. Did she find someone special? She's so transparent. Now, I find myself able to hear these complaints about the president with a smile. Most likely, the reason Emily is grinning at her cell phone is because she's looking at the messages I've sent her. I found myself becoming more and more aware of how I should treat Emily, who was often perplexed. Emily, you shouldn't be looking at your phone during work. The person in charge is having a hard time. When I told her that during our dinner, her face turned red in surprise. Oh no, were the employees watching me? How embarrassing. Despite being the boss, I find it adorable how she has such unguarded moments. Ricky, you always see right through me, and you're always correcting me when I mess up. To her, who said this with a wry smile, I conveyed with a serious look. I like you, Emily. I want the person I like to be even more wonderful, even at work. Huh. Amidst her flistered and blushing state, I found her endearing and, once again with a serious look, expressed my feelings. I would like to support you not only in your professional life, but also in your personal life as your lover. She blushed bright red up to her ears and nodded, yes. That was the start of our romantic relationship, and it triggered my decision to transition to her company. I didn't switch jobs just because of my lover. 
I was already exhausted from the unreasonable demands of my previous boss and had been considering a job change. We're striving to support each other as good partners in both work and personal life. Fast forward a few years, we got married. As our life stage changed, I also stepped up at work. Now, as her executive assistant, I support and oversee my wife's work from the closest perspective. I want to support you throughout our lives, both at work and in personal life. When I say this, my wife responds with a smile. I'm glad to have met you. Let's support each other in both work and personal life. A woman I met at the subway station and had always been intrigued by. Now, as my dear wife and partner at work, I hope we can continue to support each other. How was that? Your channel subscriptions serve as motivation for our production. See you in the next video. My name is Robert Stanton. I'm a salesman at a company that's ingrained in the local community. This year I'll be turning 28, but this city isn't where I grew up. I left my hometown as soon as I graduated high school and made a beeline for this place. I'm genuinely thankful to the boss who hired a high school graduate like me and helped me grow into the man I am now. Back in the day, I had quite a reputation as a troublemaker in my hometown. You could say I was a bit of a wild child. I had a thing for motorcycles, and I was pretty darn good in a fight too. Or rather, I guess I just hated losing. After all, you can't lose a fight if you don't admit defeat. However, my wild antics definitely caused some headaches for my folks and teachers back home. These days, I'm all reformed and a respectable member of society. I don't go back to my hometown, but each time I reach out, I can tell my parents breathe a little easier. I've even started to send them a little money now and then. One day, after coming back from a client's place, I got a call from the boss. Apparently, he'd been waiting for me. I made my way to the boss's office, where the ever-white-haired man greeted me. I apologize for keeping you waiting. As I lowered my head in apology, the boss just smiled and said, no problem. This boss of mine, he's one of the good guys and is well known even in this town. He's pretty invested in community development and knows a lot of folks. People come to him for advice on all sorts of things, not just work related. And he's always been incredibly caring. Despite having no ties to him, he took me under his wing like I was his own son. I was motioned to sit on the guest sofa. As I sat down, the boss started to talk. Sorry for being so sudden, but Robert, what do you think about matchmaking? Huh? Caught off guard by the sudden proposal, all I could do was let out a puzzled sound. I mean, it's true my social life lacks a feminine touch mainly because I haven't felt the need for it. To set the record straight though, it's not like I can't attract the opposite sex. It's just that I haven't felt like dating anyone. I still think I'm in the middle of getting my life back on track. I just wasn't in the mood to get a girlfriend. But what the boss suggested was matchmaking. This wasn't just about introducing her, it was about setting me up for marriage. Moreover, the introduction came from the boss, who was my benefactor. I felt anxious, wondering if there was any way out for me. I was trying to think of a way to decline, but my mind was all over the place, especially at a time like this. Listen, she's the daughter of the owner of Harris Enterprises. You've seen her a few times, haven't you? She shows up at Chamber of Commerce parties too. I'd seen the daughter of the head of Harris Enterprises before. She was well known in this part of town. But not because she's cute. She's famous for never smiling. It sounds good to call her a cool beauty, but she has zero sociability. 
Her beautiful eyes and well-proportioned face stood out even at the Chamber of Commerce parties. I had always been friendly with the Harris Enterprises and the boss, and I wondered if maybe the boss couldn't refuse them. She is about the same age as you. The president said he wanted me to introduce a good young man, and Robert, your face immediately came to mind. He handed over the marriage interview photo with a smile. When I opened the old-fashioned marriage interview photo, there was the daughter of the Harris Enterprises boss, dressed in a formal dress, sitting with a composed look on her face. She was definitely pretty and cute, but I thought I wouldn't like such unsociable woman. I have my ideals too. A homey, cute girl with a smile. I like girls who eat well. The girl in the photo doesn't look like she eats at all. She looks so out of this world that I thought she might be eating mist or something. I think I'm not worthy. I tried desperately to decline with a noncommittal phrase. What do you mean? Are you saying my eyes are clouded? There's no one more suitable than you, is there? The boss showed no signs of backing down. In the end, I was overruled by the boss's why don't you at least meet her, and I agreed to the marriage interview. Seeing the boss's happy face, I started to feel a pain in my stomach. The date for the marriage interview was set immediately, and I bought a new suit with the money the boss gave me. I wanted to decline the suit, but the boss told me not to destroy his reputation, so I ended up buying a new one. So, on the day of the marriage interview, I entered a high-class restaurant in a brand new suit. I had a sharp pain in my stomach from nervousness since morning. I hadn't told my parents about the marriage interview because I planned to decline somehow. The boss was sitting with me as a substitute for my parents. After a while of sitting, the landlady of the restaurant showed up. And with the landlady announcement that your party has arrived, the face of Harris Enterprises boss appeared. And behind the president, his daughter in a formal dress follows. Seeing her up close, she had skin like porcelain and a beauty that was somehow out of this world. I was taken aback. Sorry to keep you waiting. This is my daughter. Her name is Nora. President Harris introduces her. She slightly retracted her chin and nodded to me. Of course, there was no smile on her face. Rather, I was startled by the sharpness of her gaze when she quietly looked at me. In the end, the marriage interview was just the bosses talking while we focused on eating. It was a very uncomfortable space. The meal was finally over with the dessert, and the two bosses left the table together, saying now it's up to the young people. It's a common sight at marriage interviews. As soon as the two of them left, the girl who had been silent until now opened her mouth. Do you want to get married? Her sudden aggressiveness made me momentarily angry. Uh, who talks like that? Always take the fight if it's offered to you. That's how I've lived thus far. If someone's spoiling for a fight, I won't back down either. Her icy gaze stabbed at me, clearly pissed off at my attitude. The marriage interview was your parents' idea, wasn't it? You could have put it more tactfully. You have been staying silent throughout the meeting. Are you trying to embarrass my boss? Think about it. Once I start talking, it's hard to stop. I express my distaste for her attitude. Acting high and mighty, who do you think you are? Living a life that gives you the right to lecture others. We both seem to have confrontational personalities. After a huge argument that caused the landlady to intervene, the marriage interview ended. I figured she would be the one to reject me. Even so, she was a strong-willed president's daughter. I went back to my apartment and thought about her. I was mad, but there was a part of me that couldn't hate her, leaving me feeling unsettled. Days passed since the marriage interview and I hadn't received any rejection. Instead, I was called into the boss's office during my lunch break to be told that there was a date invitation from her. 
I was genuinely shocked and taken aback. After such a huge fight, her not rejecting me was surprising. It could be some kind of prank. I left the boss's office feeling like I'd been had. In my hand was a note with the date and time of the next meeting. I needed a drink to deal with this. As soon as I got back to the office, I asked a colleague to join me for drinks that night. That evening, after getting the news about the date from the boss, I went out drinking with my colleagues at a bar. The story of the marriage interview had apparently become office gossip, and my colleagues seemed genuinely interested. I amusingly shared with them how I had a major fight with the president's daughter at the marriage interview. My colleagues jokingly warned me, you're gonna get fired, and I felt a chill thinking it might not be that far-fetched. To shake off that anxiety, I got seriously drunk, which was something I hadn't done in a long time. A junior female colleague was doing her best to support my drunken self. As we staggered towards the subway station, I spotted Nora Harris in the crowd. Our eyes locked instantly. Then, expressionlessly she flashed me the middle finger. In response to her blatant provocation, my drunken head heated up. I was pulled along by my junior female colleague as I wobbled. Even as I was being led, I couldn't take my eyes off Nora. Noticing my gaze, Nora nonchalantly lifted her skirt to flash her pure white thighs at me. I was captivated by their whiteness. Just as I heard, watch out, you're going to hurt yourself, I crashed into a corner wall. I saw stars as I banged my head on the wall. Ouch, I crumpled over, clutching my throbbing head that I had hit hard. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Nora grinning wickedly. What the hell, I can't help but grumble to myself, she can smile after all. However, strangely, I didn't feel angry. I found myself starting to enjoy Nora's audacious personality. The date that I was dreading somehow became something I was looking forward to. On the day of our date, I still had a bandage plastered on my forehead. Despite this, Nora's expression didn't change at all. As soon as we sat down side by side on a park bench, Nora repeated the words she had said during our initial meeting. Do you actually want to get married? Hearing the same phrase again, I felt there was a cash to this matchmaking. I thought that she might have a compelling reason to get married. If there's a reason, I can help. Would you mind sharing it with me honestly? She looked at me, her eyes wide with surprise. From my serious expression, she understood I wasn't joking. After a deep breath, she began to speak. This marriage interview, it seems, was something she had requested to her father. Apparently she wanted to prove herself to Tom. She had been in a long-term relationship with her first love. But she had been betrayed by him and her best friend. Betrayed by her boyfriend and her best friend, the deeply wounded Nora wanted to get married to show them up. She wanted to show them that she didn't need them. That was the reason why she was rushing into this matchmaking. Her story left me a bit flabbergasted, but I also felt sympathy for her being betrayed by people she trusted. Being left alone suddenly is hard. I am a daughter of a president, so it'd be like you're marrying up, right? I'll also treat your parents well, if you want. We can even divorce when it suits you." Her face was dead serious as she desperately tried to persuade me. I guess she's this desperate because she still can't forget her first love. Suddenly, I find myself feeling a strange affection for her. So much for her cold beauty persona. Isn't she just a girl who can't forget her first love? I wouldn't mind going out of my way for her. After hearing her whole story, I found myself thinking like that. All right, I'll do it. Let's get married. At my response, her face lit up. Thank you. A faint smile played on her lips as she held back her tears. 
The disbalance in her expression was so beautiful that I found myself at a loss for words. It just hit me how sudden moments that capture your heart can be. The talk of marriage moved ahead swiftly. After all, she, Nora, wanted to get married as soon as possible. When I reported my plans to marry to the boss, he was happier than when his own son got married. I want to pay a visit to your parents, she said. When I was about to start looking for a wedding venue, Nora said so with a serious face. I haven't been back to my hometown or my parents' house in a long time. For me, my hometown was a place I had essentially abandoned. Only embarrassing memories remain. I was a little afraid to take her back to such a place. I didn't want to deliberately show her parts of myself that I disliked. But she said, it's a necessary step, and wouldn't take no for an answer. In a way, she almost forcefully decided on my return home. When we actually got there, I was surprised to find everything looking so familiar. The family home I so disliked returning to now felt incredibly nostalgic. Seeing my parents again after a long time, they had aged more than I imagined and looked noticeably smaller. My mom teared up at the sight of me, and when I introduced Nora as my future wife, she sobbed. She was overwhelmed with joy. My silent dad also seemed happy about my return, albeit in his own quiet way. After the greeting with my parents, I took her to something she had insisted on seeing during our visit. I led her behind the family's barn. There, her eyes lit up and she exclaimed, This is amazing. My motorcycle was just left out there, next to the barn. Surprisingly, she loves motorcycles and has a license for large ones. She'd heard about me riding a motorcycle in my student days and had asked to see it. It's not a big one, but it's a bike I cherished. She stared at it for a while and then said thank you. After that, I decided to show Nora around the neighborhood. So, this is where you grew up. Looking down on the river from the embankment, Nora said with deep emotion. Compared to the city where she grew up, this must have seemed like a peaceful countryside. Everything might be new to her. After deciding to get married and meeting a few times, Nora's expression gradually softened. She would even flash a small smile at me. If we build a home together, will she smile more? As I thought about creating a warm home, I felt a bit foolish. She's marrying me not because she loves me, I remembered. But I guess it's okay because I'm in love with her. Hey, is that you, Robert? A hoarse voice called out to me, probably from too much drink. Turning around, I saw an old friend from my rebellious days, Steve, looking at me with a surprised expression. On either side of Steve, young punks still in their prime were standing by. It seemed Steve couldn't manage to reform himself after all. Yes, but who are you again? At my reply, the heat in the room instantly surged. I figured he was a mate from my reckless past, but his features had changed so much I couldn't recognize him. The signs of a rough life were etched onto his face. You think you can just waltz back here after all this time, acting high and mighty like the old days? He glared and threatened me, but I wasn't scared in the slightest. My only worry was whether my girlfriend who was with me would be in any harm. As we locked eyes, Nora peeked her head out between us. So it's true you were a badass. She said, starting to laugh, clutching her stomach. Seeing her laugh so freely, both Steve and I were taken aback, losing momentum. Who's this you're with? She's the woman I'm going to marry. I see. Just like that, a peaceful expression fell over Steve's face as he looked at Nora. It seems like your life has been moving on just fine. Hearing that, I remembered clearly who this guy was. The moment I realized, I froze on the spot. He was my ex-girlfriend's brother. I wanted to say something, but the words stuck in my throat, 
and I couldn't get anything out. While I was frozen in place, he gave Nora a gentle pat on the shoulder and smiled. Be happy with Robert. I had a sister too. She's not in this world anymore, but do it for her sake as well. Leaving those words behind, he started to walk towards his car parked under the levee. The way he slouched slightly as he walked looked like a testament to the past he was carrying. As I stood there in a daze, Nora took my arm and smiled. Should we go visit your ex-girlfriend and your buddy? At her words, I shuddered. I wondered how she knew, my mind spinning. I left my hometown because of a motorcycle accident. I loved motorcycles since my rebellious days, and in my youthful folly, I thought reckless riding was cool. Back then, my girlfriend was a year younger, and she often rode behind me on my motorcycle. The night of the accident, I was at the police station because of a fight I got into during the day along with my parents and my school teacher. When she heard I was taken to the station, she panicked. She was riding on the back of my buddy's bike to come pick me up from the station when the accident happened. It wasn't because they were riding recklessly. The driver of the compact car that hit their motorcycle was an unlicensed high schooler. He was a kid just like us, up to no good and apparently he fled the scene without even calling an ambulance. When I was finally released from the police station, I remember being punched out of the blue by her brother at the entrance. When I finally saw her and my buddy in the cold morgue, I couldn't even cry. I was left in a state of utter disbelief, emotionless, unable to do anything but gaze at the two of them. Afterward, as soon as I graduated, I left my hometown. I left everything behind, including my home, to start afresh. To my surprise, Nora seemed to know all about this. My dad would have definitely looked into my potential match. She said with a hint of regret. It made me wonder, knowing all that, why she would agree to this matchmaking. Knowing my past, how did this match even happen? By all accounts, I was a nuisance, wasn't I? Did her father not consider the harm it could do to his daughter? Times change. My dad understands that, and so do I. She retorted, sounding a bit upset. I scratched my head. Realizing the depth of Nora's father's understanding. Perhaps being raised by such a parent is what made Nora as compassionate as she is. Let me meet her and his best friend. For the first time, I visited the graves of my ex-girlfriend and best friend. Nora stood next to me, her hands folded in silent prayer. When I asked her what she'd been talking about, she said, I was informing them about our marriage, with a chuckle. I declared that I was taking Robert. With a serious face, Nora walked ahead, leaving me stunned. She turned back and reached out to me. I took her hand. We held hands for the first time. Her hand was slightly sweaty, perhaps from the nervousness. Her face was calm as always. When I gently swung our hands, she looked down and gave a small, shy smile. Her shy smile was endearing. I wished she could open up to me sooner. And so, we walked hand in hand down the sunset road, lost in thought. Six months after greeting my parents, we were finally on the eve of our wedding. Nora was still a grad student and surprisingly, busier than I was with my job. You're free to do what you want on your last night as a bachelor, you know, Nora told me at the cafe we were meeting at. My co-workers had invited me for drinks, but I wasn't particularly excited about my last bachelor's night. I was a little worried that Nora might get cold feet at the last moment. Nora, unaware of my feelings, seemed slightly upset. I think she feels guilty for pushing me into this marriage. Ew, how awful. Nora's face fell as she raised her voice. Do you know them? It's my ex, Tom. As I turned to the entrance, I saw a man in a suit and a trendy-looking girl entering the cafe. 
When the man spotted Nora, a distasteful grin spread across his face. He walked straight over to our table. Long time no see. So, you're getting married, huh? He talked as if we were close, but his eyes weren't smiling. He was a good-looking guy, but there was a hint of danger about him. Tomorrow is out wedding. It's a small ceremony for my family only. This is Robert. He's going to be my husband. Nora introduced. I gave a slight bow and muttered a quick hi. The man looked down at me as though I was something disgusting. The girl with him looked anxious. So, you're being shipped off to a husband so soon. Is this an arranged marriage or just a move to get back at me? Pathetic. Despite his provocative words, her expression remained unchanged. She cast her eyes down, seemingly ignoring the man's harsh words. Even if Nora could shrug it off, I couldn't. I glared at the man from my seat. My attitude seemed to make him falter slightly. I don't know where he comes from, but I'm not about to be bested by some man who's probably never thrown a punch in his life. Are you trying to pick a fight with my wife or with me? I don't back down from a fight, you know. What are you gonna do? So what if it's an arranged marriage? Nora is the woman I chose. She's too good for you. When I growled back, Tom's face went pale. Layla, who fell in love with Tom, pulled the man's sleeve and said in a low voice, Stop it. Really? You're gonna marry this uncouth man? Don't expect to be happy. Tom spat out a petty parting shot, then hurried out of the cafe as though he was fleeing. Nora watched him go, her face stunned. Then, she turned to look at me intently. I felt strangely uncomfortable under her gaze. Double what? Unable to endure Nora's scrutiny, I turned away. Ignoring my discomfort, she placed her hands on my cheeks and turned my face towards her. Do you? Love me. She looked deeply into my eyes and quietly asked the question. Caught off guard, I started to panic. My body temperature rose dramatically. At the same time, an irrational anger welled up in me. What a clueless woman. My words slipped out in embarrassed frustration. She frowned and gave my cheek a firm pinch. Ouch, ouch, stop it. I just like you, okay? I never said you had to like me back. The pinching fingers finally released me, but my moment of relief was short-lived as she swiftly slapped both her hands on my cheeks. Why do I have to endure this? I glared at Nora, my eyes watering from the pain in my cheeks. How clueless can you be, you thick-headed man? Surprised by her sudden confession, I pinched my own cheek. I wanted to make sure I wasn't dreaming. My cheek did hurt, and she was standing in front of me, looking angry. And she seemed to be on the verge of tears. Making the bride cry the day before the wedding was unforgivable. I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I realized that I was the clueless one. She had been giving me signals all this time, and I had missed them. Nora stood there, her face pouting. Tomorrow, she would be standing next to me in a pure white wedding dress. I was glad I could confirm her feelings the day before our wedding. We might have our fair share of arguments, but we'd be a happy couple. Indeed, Nora and I were a perfect match. My mother's illness progressed in the blink of an eye. My aunt's resilient mom started to forget things, and by the time I realized, her disease had taken a hold. It was early onset Alzheimer's disease. When I heard the diagnosis, my heart almost stopped. My dad passed away when I was just a kid, and I grew up with my grandmother in my mother's family home. With the inheritance and life insurance from my grandfather and father, we never felt financially deprived. My mom began showing symptoms when I was in college. The disease tends to progress faster in younger patients. With just my elderly grandmother and me, a student, it was impossible to take care of my mom at home. 
we quickly made the decision to place her in a well-equipped care facility. Of course, we visited her as much as time allowed. After school, on Saturdays and Sundays, sometimes she would remember me, sometimes she wouldn't recognize me at all. Visiting mom was both a joyful and painful experience. During those days, I noticed that fresh roses were always displayed in her hospital room. Roses were her favorite flower. At first, I thought someone might have visited her. However, fresh roses were always present in her room, no matter when I visited. Today's roses are called Kavdi Shambad, aren't they beautiful? That day, my mother seemed to be in a good mood, cheerfully greeting me. Casually arranged in a vase by the window was a rose, the cream color of which intensified towards the center of the flower. It was a variety of rose I had rarely seen before, and its beauty captivated me. Look, that girl brings them. She said, looking out the window. There were two women standing there. Do you remember her, John? That girl, that girl. She repeated, but I didn't recognize the women outside the window at all. I thought that her memory was once again shrouded in fog. Moving between the past and present, reality and dream. I understood that was the world my mother was living in. Afterwards, I put my dozing mother to bed and left the hospital room. My name is John Snyder, and I am 32 years old this year. My mother was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease about two years after I started working. Towards the end, my mom could no longer recognize me. Still, I still remember how happy she smiled when I showed her our wedding photos. My wife, Isabella, was introduced to me by my mother. Isabella was a volunteer at the nursing home and always brought roses for my mother during her visits. It was then that I noticed and decided to approach her. I fell in love with Isabella at first sight. Isabella was also a model for a popular magazine, and her radiant beauty was immediately noticeable. To be honest, I was so stunned by her beauty that I lost my words after I approached her. Um, were the roses a bother? I like them too. She asked me with a shy look, and I shook my head. Upon seeing my response, Isabella smiled and extended her right hand towards me. My name is Isabella Thompson. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time. I was overjoyed by her sudden confession. That's how we started dating and got married once I had a stable job. I wanted to introduce my bride to my mother while she was still alive. That was the reason why we hurried to get married. Afterwards, my mother passed away and my grandmother followed soon after. Isabella and I had a daughter the following year in the spring when I turned 27. Just as I had sworn to protect Isabella and our daughter, another sudden parting strikes me. During my work, my mother-in-law called me, telling me that Isabella had collapsed at her parents' house. By the time I rushed to the hospital she mentioned, Isabella had already passed away. She had suffered a heart attack, as my mother-in-law informed me. Even knowing the cause of her death, the fact of her passing doesn't disappear. I remember I was blankly thinking about such things. After Isabella passed away, I'm raising our daughter, Scarlett, single-handedly. For Isabella's parents, Scarlett was their first grandchild. My in-laws have been fully supportive of me and Scarlett. The apartment where Scarlett and I live is just a stone's throw away from my in-law's house. The house where I lived with my mother and grandmother had too many memories, so I didn't feel like living there, and after marrying, the three of us were living in this apartment. Now it's just Scarlett and me. Daddy, I'm home. My in-laws help with pickup and drop off for daycare. Scarlett comes back to the apartment after eating dinner and taking a bath. When I'm late for work, she sometimes stays overnight at her grandparents' house. 
Scarlet runs in from the entrance and hugs me. I lifted Scarlet with one arm. You must be tired from work. Haven't you eaten dinner yet? As she lined up Scarlet's shoes neatly, Isabella's younger sister, Hannah, who is my sister-in-law, asked. It has become Hannah's daily routine to reheat the food that my mother-in-law sends and prepare my dinner. Hannah, being Isabella's sister, was unlike the vibrant and radiant Isabella. She was rather quiet and inconspicuous. I felt a bit uncomfortable around Hannah. She seemed to be a shut-in and didn't seem to be working. But Scarlett, who didn't even have time to remember her mother's face, loved Hannah, who had been taking care of her all the time. For Scarlett, Hannah was like a mother figure. It was inevitable, but as a father, it was complicated. I was not fond of Hannah, but I didn't dislike her. Hannah, who prepares dinner for me every day, plays with Scarlett and folds the laundry before going home. It almost felt like we were a couple. So, when there was an unbelievable suggestion from my in-laws, I was not overly surprised. John, would you consider taking Hannah as your wife? I was called to my in-laws' house, and as I was about to drink coffee sitting on the sofa in the living room, they asked. I would have surely spit it out if I had it in my mouth. Pretending to be calm, I quietly placed the cup on the saucer. The sound of the porcelain touching echoed in the quiet room. Um, wouldn't Hannah be against that? I understand that you think Scarlett needs a mother, but... I had a strange suspicion that my in-laws were trying to push Hannah, a shut-in and seemingly jobless person, onto me. In the distance, I heard Scarlett's laughter. Probably, she was playing in the garden with Hannah. Scarlett says almost every day that she wishes Hannah was her mommy. It makes me feel sorry for her when I see that. Saying so, my mother-in-law wiped the corners of her eyes. It seemed like I was cornered from all sides. Even so, we have to hear Hannah's feelings. I'm sure she would be against it. As I was saying this to Jelly Refuse, the large sliding door that connected to the living room creaked open. I have no problem, as long as you're okay with it, John. The one who opened the door and called out was Hannah. The tone was as matter-of-fact as if it were a business call. See, even Hannah is saying so. What do you think? Um, even if you ask me what I think, the expectation-filled gaze of my in-laws was heavy. Moreover, Scarlet was watching me with her eyes glowing from the window. Only Hannah kept gazing at the moon floating in the sky without expression. With a thin chin and slightly neurotic thin lips, she looked nothing like Isabella. I can't, I should decline. Just as I was about to speak with that thought, Hannah, who had been looking up at the moon, quietly laughed. Under the moonlight, her pale skin seemed to be reflecting. A quiet beauty that seemed to emit a fragrance. It was a smile that made me feel as though I'd discovered one of Hannah's secrets, unknown to anyone else. It reminded me of the scent of the roses I once smelled in the garden my mother made. It was as if the scent was wafting over from Hannah. I was caught in such an illusion. Ah, uh, I think I want to think about it a bit. These were the words that slipped from my mouth, even though I intended to refuse. Even I had answered unconsciously. My in-laws breathed a sigh of relief and repeatedly bowed their heads to me saying, Thank you. Hannah, the person in question, looked at me with a slightly surprised expression for a moment. Thank you in advance. All I could do was feel embarrassed and scratch my head at Hannah, who had deeply bowed her head. The trial period before marriage had begun. Living together as three in the apartment was difficult, so we moved to the separate building of the house in my in-law's property that Isabella and I were planning to move into. My father-in-law is a businessman who greatly expanded the company his predecessor created and is a wealthy man, owning much of the land in this area. Isabella was the lady of that house. The in-law's property is wide, with two separate buildings in addition to the main house. 
I still haven't fully grasped the full extent of the city. The guest house was built in the style of the early 1930s, inspired by the distinctive homes of the 1920s. It was a blend of traditional American and European architectural styles, conjuring a nostalgic vibe. Since I was planning to move in with Isabelle at the time, it had been somewhat refurbished. The move took place immediately, and my peculiar premarital cohabitation with Hannah began. Scarlett was always laughing happily, happy to be with Hannah all the time. With anxiety, I began my life with Hannah. Once we started living together, I noticed many things on a daily basis. For example, about Scarlett. I thought that Scarlett was more attached to Hannah than anyone else because Hannah was spoiling her more than anyone else. In fact, she scolds her when necessary, praises her when necessary, and laughs together with her, being silly. I was surprised to see that she was properly disciplining Scarlett. The same was true with cooking. I thought my mother-in-law had brought me the food she made. The dinner I ate every night was made by Hannah. She quickly added one more dish with leftovers and effortlessly took care of other house chores. As I realized that Hannah, who seemed expressionless, was actually expressive, I became attracted to her. I thought it was quite blunt of me, but I couldn't stop my honest feelings. That's how comfortable life with Hannah was for me, surprisingly so. Even though we were living together with marriage in mind, our bedrooms were separate. Hannah said she couldn't sleep if she felt someone's presence. Because of such circumstances, it took me a while to notice Hannah's secret while living together. One early morning, I woke up to the sound of the front door opening and closing. When I slightly opened the curtain to check outside the window, I saw Hannah walking towards the back of the yard. I put on a hoodie over my pajamas and quietly followed Hannah. Hannah kept going deeper into the property. That's unknown territory for me. After passing through the grove of trees, I could see an old wooden fence in front of me. The land surrounded by the wooden fence didn't seem that wide even from outside. Hannah opened a small wooden gate in the corner of the fence and walked inside. It was early morning still dim and chilly. In the cool air, I felt a familiar scent. Unable to resist, I followed Hannah and peeked through the slightly open gate. An incredible scenery was spread out before me. Just as I imagined, the area within the fence was narrow. But in that small space, a myriad of flowers were blooming splendidly. At the end of a tiny path, there was a quaint little gazebo. I walked through the arch of climbing roses just inside the gate and stepped into the small garden. Hut John, what brings you here? Hannah turned around from where she had been looking at the roses. I saw you leaving the house. What's this place? I had no idea this garden existed. I looked around at the garden full of blooming roses and marveled at them. There were many types of roses, ones climbing up obelisks, ones growing in bushes, and ones in pots. Small herbs and flowers were blooming around my feet. Looks and planned yet thoughtfully cultivated. That was the garden we were at. I received this land from my grandmother when I was a little girl. She told me to grow it however I wanted. Come to think of it, I recall Isabella mentioning Hannah was very close to her grandmother. She even missed our wedding because her hospitalized grandmother couldn't attend. This garden is where my journey as a gardener began. Without it, I think I would have been unemployed. I was surprised and blurted out, what? I knew it. You thought I was a shut-in and neat, didn't you, John? I thought so. Hannah said with a dumbfounded look on her face. Because as far I know, Hannah seemed to be always at home and showed no signs of a job. It was only natural I misunderstood. Hannah then went on to explain. She was a professional gardener, a horticulture specialist. 
She provides gardening advice to construction companies and teaches gardening classes at local community centers, among other things. The reason we never bumped into each other outside was because she always used the back door. I had no idea this secret existed. I'm shocked. Oh John, this bud is about to bloom soon. Hannah pointed at a rosebud gleaming with morning dew. Seeing my misunderstanding cleared, she showed a genuine smile, the first I had seen from her. We watched together as the rosebud slowly unfolded. Wow, it's beautiful. This rose is called Kamdisham Bud. The petals were a creamy color that deepened towards the center. To me, this rose was a reminder of my mother and Isabella. While looking at the Kamdisham Bud, I was taken back to various memories. My mother, before falling ill, was a dedicated gardener, particularly adept at cultivating roses. Our family garden was always filled with blooming roses. The Comedy Shambad was among them. I remembered when Isabella and I went to sort through my mother's belongings, the Comedy Shambad was in full bloom. At that time, I asked Isabella the name of this rose. It was intended as a bit of a romantic riddle. I was wondering if Isabella remembered the rose that marked our meeting. However, Isabella had completely forgotten and couldn't name the Comte de Chambaud. I remembered feeling a bit disappointed and lonely. When I mentioned my fondness for roses, Isabella said she liked them too. Looking back, since we've been married, I can't recall ever having roses displayed in our home. Somehow, the puzzle in my head feels disjointed. And then I found a possibility. When I realized it, I felt like the puzzle in my head snapped neatly into place. You were the one who gave the roses to mom, not Isabella, weren't you? And my question, Hannah flinched. She turned away and answered, no, you're wrong. Her expression seemed stiff as she looked away. I was convinced by Hannah's attitude that my hypothesis was correct. These roses were my mom's favorite. Usually, she'd forget about me, but she remembered me that day. I think it must have been because of these roses. Thank you. At my words, Hannah sighed as if she had given up. I'm sorry for lying. Isabella told me to keep it a secret. I've known about you for a long time, John. Turning towards me, Hannah gave a troubled smile. Uh, even before Isabella and I met at the care facility, that was a long time ago. Back when Hannah was still in elementary school. Isabella, her sister, was a bright and flashy figure at the center of their family. Hannah, on the other hand, was described as a plain and quiet child. She shared that she had a bit of a stutter when she was young. Because of this, she hated speaking with people and gradually stopped communicating with her family. When she spoke, she could see the sadness on her parents' faces. She hated that. Every day, being compared to Isabella hurted Hannah. During such times, she said she was moved when she peeked into my family's garden. I was lured by the scent of the roses and peeked through the gaps in the fence, she said. As Hannah spoke, my memories began to resurface. There was indeed such a thing. A girl was peering into the garden from a gap in the fence, and my mom gently called out to her. That girl turned out to be Hannah. When my mom asked, what's wrong, Hannah suddenly started crying. Like she was spilling a secret she couldn't tell her family, expressing her dislike for her talentless self and her desire to disappear. I was surprised when the girl started crying and wiped her cheeks gently with a handkerchief I had in my pocket. Repeatedly, I soothed her back while reassuring her, it's okay. I have something special for you. Nurture it with love. It will surely respond. When this rose blooms, your heart will also become rich and filled with joy. My mom said as she handed over a small potted rose. This rose is called Kamdi Shambad, just like you, a beautiful rose. 
the pieces of memory puzzle all fall into place where they should be. The back of a girl holding a potted plant with both hands, running away. That was Hannah's back. And then I remembered what my mom had said in the hospital room. Looking out of the window, my mom said to me, Do you remember that girl? My mother knew that Hannah, who was bringing the roses, was the girl from that time. Isabella and Hannah were sisters who were volunteering. It was like the Little Mermaid in an Anderson's fairy tale. The prince, who misunderstood, had been mistaken all along. John, you told me back then, to show you the garden I'd made someday. I am who I am today because of you, John. Isabella's little lie is nothing. Thinking that Hannah, who had always kept the truth in her heart, had been watching over Isabella and me, somehow made my chest ache. I have something I need to tell you, John. Was there still another secret beyond this? My heart started to pound. Hannah took a deep breath and looked into my eyes from below. And then she said with a serious face, I've loved you all along. Could there be another line that strikes as deeply as this one? It feels like a shot straight to my heart. Why don't you move forward with me, little by little? I'm not asking you to forget Isabella. I just want you to enjoy the rest of your life with me. I was utterly blown away. The tightening in my chest, I think, was because of my overflowing love for Hannah. I'm sure Isabella would forgive me. She may be laughing in heaven knowing her secret is out. When I gently embraced Hannah, I caught a whiff of roses. Six months later, Hannah and I had a small wedding. A garden wedding in Hannah's secret garden. Surprisingly, it seemed to be the first time my in-laws had set foot there. They were left breathless by its beauty. Hannah, the bride, wore a dress not of pure white but black. Hannah chose it because Isabella wore pure white. I thought it was a choice very much like Hannah. Scarlet, as a flower girl, carried the long veil with a gleeful expression on her face. I remembered Scarlet asking Hannah repeatedly before the ceremony, You're going to be my mom, right? I'll make you very happy. Hannah hugged Scarlet and repeated her promise. I had never seen such a tender scene. Surrounded by the scent of roses, I took my first new step. Beside me were Scarlet and Hannah. Isabella in heaven would surely protect us. This garden you've created, it's truly beautiful. I told Hannah what I had always wanted to say. Hannah nodded happily in response. How was it? Your subscription to the channel would be a great encouragement for us. See you in the next video. My name is Albert Harrison, a 29-year-old office worker. If there's anything that sets me apart from others, it's that I'm a wheelchair user. I began this wheelchair life due to an injury I sustained while mountain climbing back in my student days. Many people tell me that there is no way I want to climb the mountain again after the injury, but I still do. Currently, I'm totally into free climbing. I work in a factory of a major metal processing company. I have no complaints about my working conditions, and I have a good relationship with everyone. I often think how blessed I am to be surrounded by such people. I thought I would always be in this factory, but a sudden transfer order came to me in spring. I was ordered to work at the head office. This surprised everyone in the factory, including the factory manager. It seems that the upper management wants to highlight the company's image of actively hiring people with disabilities. Though it's quite annoying to be shuffled around for such reason, I'm an office worker. It's hard to go against the directives from above. So I left the factory I was familiar with and transferred to the head office where I didn't know anyone. I was transferred to the general affairs department of the head office. As I thought, it was a position allocated for disabled hiring. 
You could tell from the arrangement of the desks on my floor that they made various adjustments to accommodate me. The CEO directly told me, we'll improve anything that makes you uncomfortable, and I became determined to contribute for the wheelchair users who will be employed in the future. Nice to meet you, I'm Cindy Miller. I'll be your mentor until you get used to the head office," said a cute woman who looked like a small animal, extending her right hand. I can do most things on my own, but when I need help, I hope you can assist me. When I said this, she replied, yes, with an energetic response. I felt slightly less tense, thinking that I might get along well with her. Oh, you must be Albert. It's a real hassle that we've been handed to take care of you. It's quite troublesome for us too," said Ethan, the section manager, with a voice that suggested he attended many drinking parties. He seemed to be in his late forties, with a prominent beer belly and po skin. My first impression was that he seemed unhealthy. I was so taken aback by his appearance that I didn't even realize the extremely rude comment he had made. I'm Albert, nice to meet you. Perhaps my response, which seemed to ignore Ethan's sarcastic comment, might have made things worse. He probably saw me as someone who's difficult to handle since I didn't react to his sarcastic comment. Ethan returned to his desk with a sour expression. Don't mind him, he always talks like that. Cindy said, frowning. It seemed that Ethan was not well liked by his subordinates. And so, my assignment at the head office began. I don't consider this a big disruption, just a minor bump in the road. The work was similar to the administrative tasks I had at the factory, and the manuals were well organized, so there were no issues. The only minor issue was Cindy. I think she probably didn't have much experience dealing with wheelchair users before. She tended to treat me as someone special. Being overly considerate made me feel somewhat uncomfortable. Oh, I'll get that for you. Cindy said as I was about to go and retrieve some document files. It's all right, I can get it myself. If I can't do something, I'll ask for help, I told her. Upon hearing my words, she looked surprised. Seeing her expression, I realized that someone else must have said the same thing to her before. The next moment, her cheeks turned red, as if she was ashamed of her actions. How about we go out for dinner tonight? When I said this, Cindy responded with a pardon. I'm asking you out. Is that okay? She looked surprised, sure, she said. After hearing her reply, I gripped the hand rims and pushed the drive wheels. My wheelchair moves smoothly as if it's an extension of me. At the filing cabinet, I turned back to the desk and saw Cindy looking worried. I gave her a small wave, while I'm fine gesture. After work that day, I asked Cindy out for dinner. You know, I commute by car. Would you walk with me to the parking lot? We agreed to meet at the company's main entrance. She was waiting for me, looking a bit anxious. In my wheelchair, I naturally look up to her from a lower viewpoint. She had a different shade of lipstick on than she usually wore at work. She must have retouched her makeup. I was a little fascinated by the slight change in her profile. Not that I'm easily smitten. She's just that captivating. So, you drive, I've got a driver's license, but never drive. Cindy said, blushing. She wears her emotions on her face, she's a candid person. I can't help but find that appealing. Oh, you two are going out, can you find a place where Albert can enter? You'd be up all night just looking for a place. Ethan, the department manager who happened to pass by, laughed out loud and made a sarcastic remark. He's always like this. Not just to me. He often says rude and discriminatory things to his subordinates. He passes his own failures onto his subordinates and acts innocent. Ethan, who is the CEO's son-in-law, can be impolite and incompetent, 
but no one can say anything to him, as my co-workers told me. Sorry to worry you, Ethan, but I've researched places that are accessible for a date. I replied with a smile. Then, Ethan clicked his tongue in frustration. He must be annoyed that no matter what snide remarks he makes, it doesn't affect me. He quickly left with a displeased look on his face. I wonder if all he can do is make nasty comments. Cindy stuck her tongue out in disgust at Ethan's retreating figure. I was more intrigued by her cute gesture than Ethan's snide remark, and it made me smile a little. During our date, Cindy was constantly surprised, which I was satisfied with as the one who invited her. When I was getting in the car, she tried to help me fold my wheelchair. I quickly folded it before she could and placed it in the back seat, and she looked at me in surprise. The same happened when we arrived at the restaurant. She was surprised seeing me set up the wheelchair and transfer myself. You really can do anything. Most things, yeah, but there are things I can't do. And what do you do then? We were having this conversation on the ramp leading to the entrance of the restaurant we had reserved. Well, I ask for help. It's no shame in admitting what I can't do. Saying that, I opened the restaurant door and escorted her in. Cindy blushed slightly and said, thank you, with a smile. Nowadays, there are more places accessible for wheelchairs. When I make reservations at a place I'm visiting for the first time, I let them know I'm a wheelchair user. This way, the restaurant isn't caught off guard and my companion doesn't have to feel awkward. The reserved table was a prime seat with a view of the beautifully lit up English garden, which was the feature of this restaurant. Sorry for suddenly asking you out, but I thought it would be good if you, as my mentor, knew more about me. I apologized to her after we had placed our orders. And then it hit me. Sorry, do you have a boyfriend or something? I hope it will not cause any misunderstandings. If she had a man in her life, there was the risk of causing significant inconvenience. Seeing my sudden rush, Cindy burst out laughing. She laughed until she was in tears. Unfortunately, there's no such man, she said, wiping her tears. She explained that she found it hilarious that I was bringing this up now. Somehow. Thanks to the laughter, I felt closer to her. And then she told me a secret she had never shared with anyone before. I too was once severely injured and was told that I might never walk again. I was taken aback by her unexpected confession. Cindy told me that she used to do paraquestrian. When she was in high school, she had a severe fall during training. At that time, the doctors had made such a prognosis. When I remember the despair I felt at that time, I still wake up at night, even now. That was something I had also experienced. What had been normal for me until then was no longer normal. I was overwhelmed with anxiety about how my life would change from then on. There were times when I stared at my own immobile legs and shed tears. No one's words of encouragement resonated with me. I had a time like that as well. Fortunately, Cindy said she was able to walk again after undergoing repeated rehabilitation and surgeries. Now, there are times when she feels like the accident was all a dream. She probably cared about me more than necessary because she saw in me the future she had once despaired about. I realized again that she was a truly kind and honest person. I know that I'm completely different from you, Albert, but I couldn't help but see myself in you. Cindy apologized, handing her head. I shook my head, telling her that there was no need for her to apologize. Do you no longer ride horses? And my question, she nodded with a somewhat sad face. She said she had become too scared to do it. I see, so, about the next day off, I asked her out on a date for the next holiday. The long-awaited day off. I picked up Cindy in my car. 
I kept the destination a secret. I had shamelessly asked her to prepare a picnic lunch. Cindy smiled a little incredulously, saying, You really have some nerve, Albert. So, I think she must have prepared it. The car ride took us to a cliff located deep in the mountains. Where is this? Cindy looked up at the towering cliff in wonder. Just watch as I climbed that. At my words, Cindy's eyes widened. At the bottom of the cliff were my old mountaineering buddies, who had been with me even before I became a wheelchair user. They were helping me because I just couldn't give up on the mountains. Are you sure this is safe? Even though you said you can do anything. No, I'm fine. Just watch. As she looked up anxiously, I climbed the rock swiftly with the support of my friends. When I reached the top and waved to her, she waved back with a face that looked like she might start crying any minute. To descend, I used a rope and a descender to get back to the ground in a jiffy. See, it wasn't that bad, right? So why don't you give it another try? You want to ride, don't you? You actually do want to ride the horse. At my words, Cindy nodded, tears streaming down her face. She must have been holding it in for a long time. I believe it's not a lie that she felt fear towards horse riding. But above that, I think Cindy had distanced herself from horse riding because she was worried about causing concern to those who cared about her. She didn't want to worry her loved ones anymore. I couldn't give up climbing or mountain climbing. I think she must feel the same. Albert, I feel like I can confidently tell my parents that I'm okay, that they don't have to worry. Cindy's face was a mess from crying and her mascara was a little smudged, but she was still attractive and beautiful. About two weeks after I was transferred to the head office, a welcome party was arranged for me in the general affairs department. The location of the welcome party was a high-end sushi restaurant, a place I wouldn't normally set foot in. Sushi is my favorite food. I was looking forward to the welcome party. However, an incident occurred on the day. I arrived at the high-end sushi restaurant where the welcome party was held when everyone else had almost gathered. When I entered the restaurant, I could see a small set of stairs. I couldn't get to the stairs past the counter because the width of the wheelchair was in the way. The sushi chef also looked surprised when he saw me. Probably, he wasn't informed that a wheelchair user was coming. It's a high-end sushi restaurant. The service is supposed to be great. Normally, I wouldn't have had to struggle in a place like this. While I was wondering what to do, my boss, Ethan, came down the stairs with a grin on his face. Oh, can you get through there? That's too bad. You can't pass because you were on that thing. Cindy and a few of my colleagues behind me held their breath. Ethan seemed a bit drunk. He was laughing while loosening his sloppy tie. All right, since it's just that you can't pass, you should just crawl here. Ethan was laughing hysterically at his own words. The atmosphere in the place froze instantly. All I had on my mind was sushi, and honestly, I didn't even want to deal with Ethan. Come on, crawl over here. You said you wanted to eat sushi, didn't you? The one who snapped at this provocation was Cindy. She slipped past me and walked briskly towards Ethan. Then she grabbed Ethan's tie. Have some shame, you pig. Cindy growled in a low voice. Everyone there must have thought for a moment that they were hearing things. Ethan seemed a bit taken aback by Cindy's forcefulness. This is bad. It could turn into a brawl in the restaurant at this rate. I smiled at the chef. Then, I brightly asked the chef. Chef, I really want to try the sushi you make, but it seems I can't get in. Can you please prepare a special sushi roll for me to take out? The chef rolled up his sleeves and said, All right, leave it to me. Cindy shook off Ethan's tie as if she were throwing away something filthy and said, I want one to please.
Cindy and I left the welcome party venue with the special sushi the chef made for us. From what I heard from my colleagues, the welcome party without me, the guest of honor, felt flat and was as quiet as a wake. Everyone seemed to be glaring at Ethan while stuffing their faces with delicious sushi. I felt a bit apologetic, but everyone said they enjoyed the sushi with a smile, so that put my mind at ease just a little. Cindy and I left the sushi restaurant and ate our sushi in a nearby park. Cindy, angry as she was, popped a piece of sushi into her mouth with a swift, impulsive gesture. You know, it might taste better if you take your time. Shut up, I'm angry, she retorted. Watching her angrily stuff her face with sushi, I enjoyed my own gourmet sushi. It was probably a treat from the restaurant's head chef. There are more toppings than the usual premium sushi. The next day, when I arrived at the office, it seemed that the events of the previous night had caused quite a stir. Apparently, my co-workers were livid at manager Ethan's behavior and were planning to lodge a complaint with HR and the higher-ups. In surprise, one of my colleagues explained, you were just the last straw. Many had been unhappy with manager Ethan's attitude for some time, but his position as the boss's son-in-law had forced them to put up with it. However, after seeing his treatment of me the previous night, everyone had decided they could no longer tolerate it as human beings. For my part, I had had my sushi and felt like maybe it was time to let it go, but Cindy said, it's for the person who gets hired next, too which made me feel a bit ashamed of my irresponsibility. I'd been somewhat self-centered, thinking as long as I was happy, everything was okay. I hadn't really thought about the people who would come after me. HR started conducting interviews, and soon it was my turn. The meeting room prepared for the investigation also had the CEO present. This was clearly seen as a serious issue. I'm sorry for the actions of my son-in-law. It's due to my lack of oversight. Please forgive us. The CEO started by apologizing, which made me feel somewhat overwhelmed. Cindy, who was interviewed before me, apparently explained everything about the incident the previous night in detail and also talked about all that had led up to it. In addition to that, it seems they managed to gather information about manager Ethan's misconduct from other colleagues as well. Albert, we're thinking of demoting Ethan and asking him to leave the headquarters. Will that lighten your mood a bit? The CEO asked. I took a moment to think about it. It didn't seem like that would really solve anything. When the CEO asked me again, what do you think of manager Ethan? I decided to be honest about my feelings. I feel sorry for him. He probably just lacks imagination. I can't say much since we just met, but I don't dislike manager Ethan. The CEO was taken aback by my response. But before that, I shared all the harassing behavior from manager Ethan that I had heard from my colleagues with the CEO and the HR manager. Still, everyone deserves a chance to start over. That includes manager Ethan, I added. I assured the CEO that I believed Ethan would change his attitude after this whole mess. Though I am single, Ethan has a wife and children. He has a lot to protect. Please give him a chance. With that, I bowed to the CEO. I'm touched by your generosity. Thank you for forgiving my son-in-law, for protecting my daughter's family. As a father-in-law, I am grateful. The CEO said, his words deeply moved me. A man who can genuinely apologize for others. If this man is at the top of the company, it's in good hands. This is a great company, I thought again. I heard you forgave manager Ethan. Cindy said at the rooftop break area. I was never really mad in the first place. Doesn't forgiving him sound a bit arrogant? Since we ate sushi together in the park, Cindy's demeanor had become much more relaxed. You know I'm thick-skinned, right? That's my charm. It's all water under the bridge now.
I said with a cheer, meeting Cindy's sidelong glance. She was angry on my behalf. Seriously, so thick-skinned it's shocking. You're a big-hearted man, and that makes you a great person. She joked around to match my mood, no longer angry, and gave me a smile. Why don't we go horse riding next time? I want you to see me in all my glory. Of course, I'll accompany you. At my response, Cindy chuckled, no need for formality. Seeing her smile made me genuinely feel that the transfer to the headquarters wasn't so bad. Later, when my boss Ethan insisted on apologizing by bowing deeply, I was completely taken aback. He tried to hug me while sniffling, so I ran away as fast as I could. My colleagues couldn't stop laughing at the spectacle. It felt like a sudden gust of fresh air had swept through the office. Cindy was laughing so hard, she was tearing up. Hey, stop laughing and help me out. That's not something I'd expect from the self-sufficient Albert. Her response left me at a loss. Ethan, still calling out Albert, wouldn't give up trying to hug me. If you'll make me your girlfriend, I'll help you. In a voice only I could hear, Cindy softly whispered this. She had a bold sight that belied her appearance. That was part of her charm. Let's not just date, let's get married. At my response, Cindy, saying okay, stood up from her chair and placed herself in front of Ethan. Could you please not smear your snot on my future husband? Her comment made the whole department erupt in laughter. Well wishes came flying from all around. Our future couldn't be brighter. Is it too soon to be looking forward to our wedding? What do you think? Subscribe the channel and it will give me the motivation to produce more. See you in the next video.